the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods moving and storage studio, it's The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm Ramsey personality George Camel, joined by my pal and confidant, best-selling author, hey, yo. Ken Coleman. What's He's up? here as well, and he is excited to take your calls about work, about purpose, about your career, and boy, is there a lot in the news uh, in that regard, Ken. So That's we're going right. to get to that. Yeah, taking your money your questions. Georgie Boy is uh, the expert. I mean, he just flat out knows how to answer it. I was bragging about you over the break. I was talking to some friends. I said, I got to connect you to my, uh, my pal. They were asking me a little bit of a nuanced uh, money question. Question. That was your way to get out of that. I'm your baby steps guy. I'm your FPU uh, coordinator guy. The nuanced retirement question, some of that, uh, you're the guy. Yeah. And you've done a Thank great you. job. So George is here for the money questions. I'm the work guy at Ramsey Solutions. So, you know, uh, your work, your job is your greatest Wealth building tools, Dave has said for decades. I want to help you there. I want to help you maximize your potential there. So if you got a sticky situation, an unknown, should I take the leap in 2023? I'm here to answer those questions. So let's it. have some fun today. The number to call is 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. And happy new year uh, to all of you listening out there, America. It's our first show back in 2023. That's right. I broke out the cardigan. It was time. Yeah, I felt like the cardigan was the uh, first of the year of the cardigan. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's jump into it. Uh, Adam is kicking us off this hour in New York City. Adam, welcome to the show. Hello, George. Hello, Ken. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking the call and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. you. What's going on? So I have, uh, speaking of nuance, right? Somewhat of a nuanced question that I also think would present kind of a deeper dive into finances and other items. But one thing that and just to give background to the question, right? I'm, I'm a younger person, 30 years old, have a decent amount of savings set up, and I've been with um, my partner, my girlfriend, for about almost three years now. Um, when you break down in just in terms of percentages and savings, you know, the big goal that I have for myself is buying a home. Some would have left that arena over the last 18 months or so due to the crazy things we've seen in the tri-state area, more specifically New Jersey. But I have about, if you could, pool our assets, right? Maybe about 90 to 95% of what to go into. And, you know, she's a child of divorce. People in my family are no stranger to divorce. And one thing I'm thinking about doing is trying to acquire a house as a premarital asset in a way of kind of protecting myself, not knowing what the future would hold. I don't know if that's the right way to be thinking about it, but working in finance, I maybe am jaded by seeing this over time and time again. So uh, maybe that's not the best mindset to have, but I can't help but think that could be a benefit to me in a smart financial move. So how just is that? To get your opinion on that. Before we weigh in on the opinion and, and, and George leading on this one, I, I'm just curious, why do you think that's a good move? And, and it's funny that you refer to it as a premarital asset. It's very, very stuffy, very, very, uh, you know, like, what I do you mean? I thought it was romantic, Ken. No, not at all. What is it? What, what do you think it's going to do for you? Well, so I've seen before where if in the event that me and my girlfriend take the next step and it doesn't work out within whether that's six months, two years, five years, ten years, whatever timeline that may be. Hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And I'm just trying to get context. If you take the next step, does that mean get married? Correct. And it doesn't work out. So we're already we're already uh, planning for the worst. Uh, it's something that I've done for most of my life that I have a hard time not doing. Yeah. Is okay. having the worst in your mind and trying to plan right, for so the worst. So keep going. So if the worst happens, why is having this premarital asset <laughs> known as a house, why is that protecting you? My understanding is that if... Right. Worst case scenario would be we get divorced. Um, I lose the house and now I kind of have to restart over. And my understanding is it was a premarital asset. And then we decided to sell the home. We would have equal access to the proceeds where okay. I wouldn't essentially be kicked out of my own house or something like that. All right, George, that's what I needed to know. Got it. Now we see where he's coming from. Well, you're, what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you want to buy this house, your name is on the, the deed, your name is on the mortgage, and her name is not a part of this at all. Let's say you guys get married. You would still, it would remain that way. Correct. You're asking for a roommate at that point. Why would she not want some skin in the game too and say, hey, what's, 
what's mine is now ours. This is we. That's a good and question. And so when you look at the deed and go, well, this is my thing I had before we were married, and so I'm going to keep it in my name to play it safe. What do you think that does to her emotionally and mentally? Yeah, it's a very fair point, and I hold no ill will towards her whatsoever and would obviously want to welcome her You didn't her answer the question. Of my life. You did not answer the question. You're a very thoughtful young man. I mean, like, really thoughtful. But if you're on answer that, the put question. yourself in her shoes. How do you think How she's going to feel? Terrible. All right. That's just not how I want to start the marriage. Now, understand the heart of it. You're scared because you've seen this play out in your family and you've yeah. seen people where I, you've seen the YouTube comments on any video about marriage where they're saying, don't get married. It, she's just trying to take you for all your worth. She's going to take you to the cleaners. They all sound like that to me for some reason in the comment section. And it's just a real kind of gross outlook towards marriage. There's a lot of negativity, a lot of cynicism. And I think the best thing you can do, if you really want to go this route, you can do a prenup. If there's inordinate levels of wealth, let's say you're coming in, you've got a million dollar net worth and she's not working or she makes a smaller salary, you could pursue a prenup as a way to protect yourselves. But doing the kind of shady, okay. I did this before we were married, so it's mine, that's going to create a ruffle. And so I would talk about it, first of all, communicate as a couple and decide together what we're going to do, if you're even going to go that route. Okay. I see what you mean, because I never knew that those things, I, I thought that even a prenup, I don't know, I guess I'm not really good at preparing for the worst. I just didn't even know well, that here's that was the deal. I, 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 I think it's one thing to batten down the hatches, if you will, an old phrase that when a storm is coming, let's, let's kind of protect the windows, but you don't know that there's a storm coming. That's a good point. It's, it's like, you know, because you try and time everything perfect and you, you worst case scenario isn't the way you should live your entire life. Adam, Adam, how old are you? 30. Adam, I am 48. And next May or this coming May, Stacy and I will celebrate 25 years of marriage. Now, I'm not a marriage expert. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't say that to get applause. I appreciate the lobby folks saying that. But I tell you this, here's what I've learned in 25 years of marriage. You can't plan for much at all other than your emergency <laughs> fund, right? Because life is going to happen. It's going to rain. That's why we preach the emergency fund. I would tell you this. If you can afford the house the way that we teach you to do it, and you get the house and then bring her in once you get married and it's our house, and then if the worst happens, you still made a good financial decision and you're still better off. George? Yeah. Uh, I'm, w I'm with you on that. And when right. that time comes, there's a lot of state laws. There's a lot of things that you need to take into account if it did go south. And so you can do some research, do your homework, but don't let that delay you from getting married and making it weak. That's what marriage is. If you don't want that, don't sign up for marriage. It's going to end uh, in a pain for both parties here. So thank you so much for the call. Wishing you the best, man. The number to call, 888-825-5225. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined by Ken Coleman this hour, and it's a free call at 888-825-5225. And if you like this show, which I hope you are, you're listening to it right now, would you mind doing us a huge favor and leaving a review, sharing it with a friend, subscribing wherever you're listening, following? That helps us spread the impact of this show. We want to reach as many people as we can this year and give them hope in every area, whether it's their money, their career, their health. And so we really appreciate that. 888-825-5225 is the number to call. Lauren's up next in Oklahoma City. Lauren, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for taking my call. Yeah, Happy well. New Year. How can we help? Um, so I am trying to figure out, you know, how do you guys uh, calculate or estimate how long it will take, take someone to pay off debt, or me in particular, to pay off debt? I love it. Well, that's a great goal to have. How much debt do you have? 
Um, between credit cards, student loans, and my car, it's uh, right around 69000 Okay. And what's your income? Uh, 66 Okay. And uh, how much margin do you have right now? Have you started doing a budget? Have you been uh, kind of following our steps for a little while, or is this all new to you? Yeah, um, I actually started um, my budgeting uh, about, I think, uh, like October, so a couple couple months ago. And um, I've got roughly, I've got, well, no, I have set $500 extra that I can for sure put towards it. Um, But, you know, sometimes I have a little bit more than that that I can do, like just... um, that's what awesome. I know I can do. That's great. Well, it takes about 90 days to get that budget really dialed in. And so you're right about that point. You've got some margin left over. And we have a great tool, actually, on our website, the Debt Snowball Calculator, where you can input every single one of your numbers, and it will show you, based on how much extra you're throwing at that very first debt, exactly how long it will take. Uh, have you been through Financial Peace University before? Uh, no, sir, I haven't. Okay, well, I'm going to gift that to you hey. to kickstart the new year, and uh, there's a bunch of tools and resources inside of that, as well as, uh, of course, the nine video lessons and so much more. So if you hang on the line, I'll get that to you, and we're still going to talk about your situation, but I want to let you know that is kind of the next steps for you. So the 69... Oh, thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. So the 69 in debt, you're making 66. What are you doing for work? Um, I'm a uh, civilian uh, federal. Okay. Awesome. And can are you able to work overtime? Um some but no not not like a lot. Do okay. you have personal uh freedom that means in your personal life to take on a second job? Probably not one that I could um I, it would have to be something I could kind of make my own schedule, um, just, you know, with kids and life sure. and whatever. So, so how um, many hours would you have? Just a rough estimate. I know you got to sit down and figure this out, but what would you say you'd have in a given week to put towards uh, a second job, side hustle? Uh, maybe 10 to 15 hours. Great. Uh, what we want you to do is, is uh, and, and again, George gave you that great resource, uh, the calculator, the debt payoff, that, that thing is phenomenal. It's going to give you the, the, the answer you called in for, but we want to speed that up. And if you can put 10 to 15 hours a week in at, let's say, $15 an hour, just run that exercise for yourself just to see what could be. Mm-hmm. And then you begin to look, okay, where can I go get something? for 10 to 15 hours that pays me $15 an hour or more. I don't want you to limit yourself to $15 an hour. It's just an example. And Lauren, when it comes to debt payoff, obviously we wanted a big chunk as possible to throw at that first debt. That's the debt snowball. List them all out smallest to largest. Attack the first one with a vengeance. And as you're doing that, it becomes kind of addictive to see how much more can I throw at this next month and next month. And so when it comes to margin, you said you have 500 bucks extra. I want to figure out ways to get more margin. So that's what we're doing right now. There's only two ways to get it. You can spend less or you can make more. And making more on top of working extra, you could sell stuff. What's this car worth? Um, I I don't know for certain, but um, maybe twenty five, twenty six thousand ish. And what do you owe on it? Um, sixteen. Okay. So there's an option. I'm not saying go do that tomorrow, but it's an option to go, hey, I could sell this car for 26. I owe 16. That leaves me with $10,000. I can go buy a $5,000, $6,000, $8,000 car, free me up from that payment, and have a few grand left over to throw at the debt. And so if this looks like it's too long of a journey, that is something I would consider doing. What is your car payment every month? Um, It's it's, uh, $295. Boom. So that makes so it, instead the, of 500 margin, you get 800 now. Yeah. Now you're starting to cook with gas. And you get another side hustle, yeah. 200 bucks, 300 bucks. Now you're over 1,000 a month to throw at the debt. And so my goal for you would be to have this paid off, based on the numbers I'm seeing, within two years. Does that feel like a stretch okay. for you right now? Um, I mean, yes, but that's, that's kind of why I'm, I'm just, whenever I kind of tried to calculate it, it was looking at, you know, maybe like four or five years. Nah. And, that's, and when it, you see that 500 number, well, if you do that for the year, that's only six grand you threw at that pile of debt. 
Right. And so we need to find a way to make that more like 20 grand a year, 30 grand a year being thrown at this debt. And if you could get to, you know, 33 a year, that's with the payments you're already making, that would get you there in two years. And that's the average amount of time it takes for folks following our baby steps with gazelle intensities. 18 to 24 months, they pay off all consumer debt. And I believe it's possible for you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was trying to work out is how can I, how can I be one of those people with the average of 24 months? <laughs> Sell stuff. I can tell you, we, we've covered cutting expenses, getting on that budget. We've covered making more money, but selling stuff. I, I'll give you a real life example. Okay. We have an emergency fund, but I hate touching it. The only thing I hate mm-hmm. more than touching my emergency fund is taxes. Mm. All right. I don't know how much you I don't taxes. like pulling money out of the emergency fund. All right. <laughs> So we recently had a situation where one of our kids wanted to change schools. We were in a contract. We did not realize the contract was tough to get out of. So we had a a $3,000 kind of a penalty. And I could have, it's not an emergency, right? I could, but we needed to come up with it quickly and I hadn't budgeted for it. You know what we did, George? Mm -hmm. What'd you do? You sold something? We sold several things and came up with almost all of it. Wow. Yeah. Give me an example. What was the highest ticket item you sold? Oh, geez. Give me George. something. You're going to make me say this? I'm, you know what it is. It's not a car. No, I sold the Peloton. Whoa. I got over it. Wow. And I know how much you love that Peloton. I loved it. But it had its season for you. Well, I got And I knew it was a depreciating asset. And I got true. I got over a thousand bucks for that. Sucker. That's pretty good. Let me tell you something. I just want people to understand now that we didn't have to do that. I could have changed my budget and paid for the $3,000. But I mean... You Why have it laying around that? the house. Well, we found it. I mean, we found we had a lot of things. We sold several things. We sold some clothes. We sold some stuff around the house on ENT. We t- stuff that we just weren't like we looked there first. Yeah. And almost created the entire amount from selling stuff. That's impressive. So Lauren, start searching the couch cushions and uh, the closets. See what you can sell on Facebook Marketplace and I'm make some you. extra money on the side. And if you do all of those things compounded, so if you go through your budget and you say, what am I actually paying for every month? You know, I don't need that subscription right now. I can cut that. I, I'm overpaying for insurance because it's my old buddy from State Farm from when I was in co- I'm going to start searching around with Xander Insurance to see if I can get a better rate. You start to do that across every single area and all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, I just gave myself a raise. I found 500 bucks a month to throw this debt uh is your old okay. buddy from, is your old buddy from state farm there's named always, jake by the way there's always a guy named jake <laughs> okay and it's always a guy you went to college with who sold you on some insurance plan that you forgot to look lauren into. you got this don't you yes you got some you got some confidence now don't you yeah i actually just went through all of my subscriptions the other night and either lessened them or canceled them all together and i shuffled some things around to where it's a little more a little easier to see um you know what i what see I now we're talking running. and lauren you've got you got friends right she has friends Ken. she's got lots of friends. don't borrow their netflix password if you want to watch something oh, they'll be all right hey i hear netflix is cracking down on that george before they do it's time to catch up on emily in paris right ken there i don't go. even know what that is he's and I'm pretending so glad he's a I huge don't. fan All right, Lauren, hang on the line. Austin's (laughs) going to pick up. We're going to gift you one year of Financial Peace University as well as Every Dollar Premium to help you along this journey. And here's my only request. If I give you all that, I want you to come and do your debt-free scream and share your story with America to show them what the other side of gazelle intensity looks like. We are so proud of you. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined by Ken Coleman this hour. And on the debt-free stage in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions, it's Amanda. Hey! Amanda, how you doing? Hey! So if you're on the debt-free stage, it means one thing only. 
you are debt free. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Where are you from? Um, well, I was living in Georgia when I was paying off debt, but I'm currently in the process of moving to Colorado. Nice. And all my stuff is in a storage pod. Look so. at Fun. you. <laughs> did you use pods moving in storage? I did. <laughs> that wasn't even planned. <laughs> wow. George with a little extra commission on that. That's a big <laughs> win for me. Okay. So, Amanda, uh, tell us how much debt you paid off. A little over 60000 in 19 months. Whoa. Wow. That's pretty intense. What was your range of income during that time? I started at 74000 and then with working overtime, weekends at a second job, I went up to about 100000 Wow. You're not scared of work. That's for sure. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yeah, what do you do? I'm an occupational therapist. Wow. Great yeah. career. And then what was the uh, overtime second job? As an occupational therapist oh, okay. at the uh, local hospital to work nice. weekends. So. Stick to what you know, mm -hmm. and it makes good money. Wow. Yep. That's fantastic. So what kind of debt was the 60? Um, it was about 40000 of student loans slash a personal loan. So it was my parents that loaned me the money for the rest of my grad school. Ooh. Um, but I would say it was a pretty serious loan when your mom writes, writes out an amortization schedule and makes you oh. sign it. So. Hello. That is next level. <laughs> Did she deliver that with a Hallmark card? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Here's the some interest. Amortization. <laughs> schedule from mom. Yikes. If mom whips out that word, you're in dangerous yeah. waters. She's an accountant and I have ah. a dad as an engineer, so. Okay. You're used to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. So was this, did you pay it off before the Thanksgiving dinner got awkward? That one was this? <laughs> yeah. I paid it off over the summer. Oh, that's great. Good for you. Okay. So what else? You're and the then it was student also personal loan? 20000 on a car because when you get a real job, you have to get a new car, right? right. That's right. Yeah. It's a rite of passage. Yeah. Do something stupid. <laughs> Okay, and what kind of car was this? Uh, it's a RAV4. And you still got it? Mm -hmm. Great out in the vehicle. Parking lot. Oh, love it. We'll go, me and Ken will go check it out. At the yeah, park. sure. Yeah, we'll for take, car it, guys. take it for a spin. <laughs> oh, okay, so tell us how you got on this Ramsey journey. What got you started on the Ramsey way? So um, I had been slowly paying off my um, loans over 2021, and then I was at a gas station, and my credit card was all mangled, and I was, like, trying to shove it in the thing, you know, to pay gas, and it made me go inside, and I had to read off the number to the guy at the gas station. I was like, well, that was annoying. And so I was like, maybe I've been swiping this thing a few too many times. Uh -huh. And <laughs> so then I went home, and I looked at my credit card statement, and I had always paid it off, you know, with what was in my checking account in the first time the balance was higher than what was in my checking account and I was like this is not gonna work I got to figure something out and I was just like so embarrassed at that I had spent $600 on food the month before Wow! <laughs> so that you had that pit in the stomach feeling going yeah oh my gosh I can't even afford to pay this off yeah um, so then I had heard of Dave Ramsey in the past and I started to listen to the podcast and then went to an FPU class and got serious so then over the next seven months I paid off 45,000 whoa so yeah 45 was gone in seven months? Yeah, the last seven months, yeah. How did you do that? Um, I just worked every day almost, except for maybe two days a month. Um, I stopped eating out. I used the Every Dollar app. Um, I just really cut down on my expenses and put every extra dollar. You were living on it. nothing. Yeah. What kind of meals were you eating? Because you said you were spending a lot on food. What shifted? I just quit, How did it quit going out, quit buying drinks out, and as much going out with friends um, and just ate more at home. So. Did they understand or were they like, oh, that's weird, but okay. Um, yeah, I had some friends that were like, I mean, I guess if that's what you want to do, but I mean, I'm not going to do it. So. But you survived it socially. <laughs> I did. I you did survive it. You still have friends. It. Yes, Because a lot of people are scared to do this plan because they go, I got to live my life, George. Yeah, what do you want me to yeah, do, man? Yeah. But How far did you uh, stretch your groceries? Um, I shop at Aldi a lot. So I'm a big Aldi That's shopper and George is so happy right now. There, yeah. Warmed my heart. You George went order in the cart. Yeah. Uh -huh. You went yep. viral for telling people that. Oh, that's uh, right. What was your controversial I said, statement? I said the average meal at home is four bucks. Average meal eating out is 13 bucks. It's 225% more, 3.25 times right. more. And I got so much hate. Skewered. Yeah. Yeah. But you're telling me that it's true. Yeah. It's way cheaper to go shop at Aldi than it is. Because people say, well, oh, yeah. my time is worth something, George. And your time is clearly worth a lot more than theirs is. You make good money. Yeah. How I do have... you justify just cooking at home and wasting all of your time doing dishes and cooking? Um, I like cooking, so it wasn't too bad. Um, but I just made time for it and realized that on the other end, then I can eat out. Whenever I want, when I don't Boom. have to eat it. Boom. <laughs> what was your first meal like after you paid off the debt? You're like, I'm going to live a little. Uh, I Do you don't remember know if it? I really had like a big one. I 
can't really think of You were still shopping at Aldi. Yeah, I still shop at Aldi. Yeah. I love that. In the RAV4, there's this little compartment that like coin and I have one quarter in there for my Aldi cart. Yes. Yeah, see? <laughs> I don't even know what know. this is. Can't, to I get, don't have to any get idea. a shopping cart out, you have to put a quarter into the cart. It's very old timey and that releases the cart for you to shop with. Boy. That yeah. that takes nickel and diming to another level. But it forces you to go put back the cart to get your quarter back out. Oh, you get the quarter back. Once you put the cart back. Oh, these Audi people. Like, Is it obvious to everybody that I've never darkened the door of an Audi before? I, yeah. Well, I, it's Aldi. Aldi. <laughs> oh, Audi is a vehicle manufacturer. No, I know what Audi is. Oh, it's Aldi. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think it's German. I'm going to take some notes over here. This is not a sponsored right. uh, call for I Aldi. I feel like this great. whole thing took on like a Food Network uh, theme. Well, Ken, this what is big was the, for people her age. It is. Food what is was one of the, the biggest hardest issues? part? Was it not hanging out with friends? Was it? Well, what was the most difficult part of this journey? Because you went after it. Um, I think the hardest part was just not taking as many vacations, not doing as much, trying to make things cheaper, and then honestly just working a lot. I mean, I worked three weekends a month, so I had like two days off a month. So I didn't really have wow. time to do anything anyways. What was the... <laughs> okay, so I, we hear these stories a lot. And I, I love the fact that you are younger. Uh, what would you say to young people who are, who are in the situation you were in and they're faced with work in themselves to where they're bone tired, but for a very clear goal. What did you mentally say to yourself? What when you when you felt tired, maybe you didn't want to go in, you kept working crazy hours. What was the message for yourself? Um, I think I had never planned to live in Georgia and I always wanted to move after that. So it was the fact that um, if I wanted to move and do something else, like I didn't want debt strapped on my back. So it was just kind of the end goal of I'd rather just do this short term, work a bunch, get it over with, and then I can do what I want. Do so. what you have to do yeah. so you can do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. So yeah. many people have goals, they have dreams, and they can't pursue those because money is an obstacle in their life. And I love your story because you're saying, hey, if you would just be willing to sacrifice for 19 months for you, you can have all of that on the other side. Mm -hmm. I never could have no made anxiety. this move to Colorado and had my stuff in a storage pod and taken a few weeks off work. If I was living paycheck to paycheck, I never mm -hmm. could have made mm -hmm. it happen. So I felt like once I did that, kind of like the world is your oyster. Now I can do what I want Absolutely. and go where I want. And yeah. So what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Um, I think the budget was big for me, like realizing where I was spending my money and where I could really cut back. Um, and then also just having that end goal in mind. That's awesome. Well, we've got the Live and Give box for you to gift to someone else, to use it for yourself. It includes the Total Money Makeover, Baby Steps Millionaires, and One Year Financial Peace University. Have you been through the newest edition? Uh, no, I did it right before it changed. Oh, well, maybe time to go through it and take a friend along with the journey who went, hey, what do you... That stuff you did when you weren't eating out and now you don't have any debt, can you show me how to do that? That's what's going to start happening, and we're so proud of you. And real quick, who do you got with you? I got some support with you today. Um, this is my mom. Hey, mom. Love it. <laughs> She's the one that made the schedule. The amortization <laughs> schedule. Oh, yeah, I know. I, trust yeah. me. I, I, that's why I wanted to get some attention yeah. on her, all right? We don't she hear that one it. very often. Accountants love attention, Ken. I know that. <laughs> oh, that is true. Oh, that's my true. goodness. Well, we are so, so proud of you. You are yes. us. Just showing people what it looks like to do this plan and do it with a smile and still enjoy your life. And now you've got the rest of it ahead of you to truly live your dreams, achieve your goals without debt on your shoulders. All right, the moment we've all been waiting for, Ken. Yep. It's Amanda from Macon, Georgia. $60,000 paid off in 19 months, making seventy four dollars up to 100000 with overtime and crushing it and shopping at Aldi. <laughs> Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. One, two, three. I'm debt-free! Yes, she is. That's so fun. She never wants to hear the word amortization schedule again. Or Aldi, apparently. No. I need my apologies to the fine grocery chain. I'll, <laughs> I'll get that right for the future. Oh, but I love it. Willing to do whatever it takes yes. for freedom. Solving for freedom. That's what I want for all of you listening in 2023. Amanda showed you. Now it's up to you. Are you going to do this stuff or not? You get to make that choice. This is The Ramsey Show.
This is The Ramsey Show. All right, listen up for the business owners out there. Do you feel like you never have time to work on your business because you're too busy working in it? Well, you are not alone. We talk to thousands of business owners every year. One of their biggest problems is not having enough time. So if you feel that way, let this be the year you learn to trust your team and delegate tasks so you can really do the important work of growing your business. You can find out exactly how to do that by checking out Delegation, the latest quick read from Dave Ramsey that drops today. That's right. You'll learn the why, the when, and how to delegate, and you'll learn the two reasons why owners don't delegate and how you can overcome them. I mean, you're learning how to delegate from Dave Ramsey himself, the same guy who started his small business with two employees and now leads over 1,100 team members here at Ramsey Solutions. He knows a thing or two about delegation. And remember, your business will only grow and thrive to the extent that you commit to delegating. So pick up your copy of the Delegation Quick Read today at RamseySolutions.com slash store. And while you're waiting for that book to arrive, you can check out the latest episode of the Entree Leadership Podcast, which I host. And uh, Dave Ramsey and James Clear are our guests on this episode, and they talk about the importance of habits and delegation. You don't want to miss this one. You can find the Entree Leadership Podcast for free wherever you stream your podcasts. Open phones this hour, 888-825-5225. We're taking your calls about money, life, work, purpose, you name it. And Mitchell is on the line in Montgomery, Alabama. Mitchell, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate you all. And Ramsey Solutions, I've taught FPU at my church. And uh, the situation I'm in now is I have lost my job. Um, oh. I had worked at a school, a private school, where... Uh, had a great head of school that I worked for, and he left. And shortly after that, the uh, board chair came in and, and told me that my position uh, would be eliminated. So I'm on a, about an eight-week leave and then uh, working on finding something else. So my question is a uh, couplefold, but mainly how do I represent this time um, to future employers, future schools. I'm also looking at educational consulting firms, and I've had my own consulting firm before, so I'm thinking about just starting that up. But how do I represent? I've got some interviews coming up, and I am uh, still employed by the school. I coach there still. I've decided to stay on and do that and finish up the season. But uh, just curious how you, in your wisdom, would represent that to future employers. Uh, it's a great question, and let's start with you don't need to have any sense of shame. I mean, people get laid off. I mean, we saw uh, some very large companies uh, with a pattern of, uh, you know, sizable layoffs as we went into the fourth quarter, third, fourth quarter of last year. It's largely because people are trying to anticipate a recession. So layoffs in uncertain economic times – um, it's kind of the norm. And uh, it's also very normal when you have transition at the top. So you've been laid off in a certainly uncertain economic time. And you were also laid off as a result of leadership transition. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm, I'm speaking to your heart and your head first. Uh, but mm. Sounds like to me, you're still employed there. So as you're representing this, you, you're not even bringing up the fact that you've been laid off. I mean, you're still employed there. It's just you stayed on as a coach. It may be less money, maybe less time, but it's not like you have to go in and go, well, I just got laid off, but I decided to stay as a coach. I mean, the bottom line is, is you are very experienced as an educator, true or false? True, 20, 24 years in yeah. school. And, uh, and you were also, you were not laid off because of any type of behavior or uh, lack of production, true or false? Uh, that's true, I was not. Yeah, it's restructuring and mainly financial for the school, I think. So that's the narrative, if you even have to bring it up. But the, the bottom line is you're still employed, Correct. Yes, I will be till the middle of February. So as you're searching and they're saying, okay, why are you joining us? You, the, the answer is simple. Um, the school, the recent headmaster who I work for, he's transitioned out. Uh, the board is looking to make several organizational changes. And uh, it's pretty apparent to me that I'm not going to be in the long term there due to financial reasons. And I want to stay in the game. I mean, that's the, that's the conversation. That's the narrative. There's no shame. There's no spin. It's just the facts. 
great. And yeah, there's so nothing. Uh, listen, listen. They appreciate that because you've got something to offer. So you're always focusing on what you can do. But when they're asking why you want to join us, you're not trashing anybody. You're not. You're taking the high road, which you have on this call. And, and so you control the narrative. Hey, bottom line is new. My old leader, who I loved, is gone. Financial issues at the school, and it's best for me to move on. And I want to stay active, and and I want to be proactive, not wait for the for the shoe to fall, if you will. I'm going to move forward. And so that's all I would do. That's that's great. But let me ask you this: I started my own educational consulting firm um, a, a few years back to give my wife flexibility to follow her career, and I'm planning to just open that back up in the near term not knowing what the future holds, would it, that be another positive direction that I decided to open that up and leave the school? Did uh, you make, the did you make the same kind of money when you were doing that as a consultancy that you're making, that you were making, uh, in a full-time educating role? Ironically, I made almost double. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. Um, yeah. 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 I, I would absolutely start it back up. Do you have reason to believe that you're going to be able to get back to that kind of revenue pretty quickly? Uh, you know, it's all, all based on network relationships and uh, pandemic help too. I helped some schools change their model in the pandemic and that, that's what it was. And so then I tell you what I would do. Based on how you answered that, I don't think your confidence level is is there that it's going to do that. So what I would do is, is I would keep uh, applying, keep interviewing, and let's land a traditional role in education. And then let's also do this other thing on the side. And let's see where it goes. And if it starts to spike back up again, then I think I would go go that route, depending on what you want to do. Do you want to work for yourself or you don't work for an institution as just I'm on this team? I think you get to decide that. But as of right now, I would not just bank on the consultancy firing back up that quickly. I would hedge my bets by getting another education job, relaunching the consultancy, and let's see what happens. That sounds great. Thank you for what you do, and I'm able to rest easy because we have the emergency fund. We're debt free except for the house and all. Thanks That's amazing. Everything. That is awesome. Thanks. Proud of you, Mitchell. Keep your head up. So I know cool. it stinks, and I would also say, Mitchell, don't touch that emergency fund. Losing your job is under the level of an emotional emergency. But it does not have to be, George. No, I'm going to try to keep income coming in. A financial emergency. Let me explain that because there are layoffs on the horizon. I mean, I'm just telling you, I don't know where, I don't know when. I can't see into a crystal ball like that. But anytime you have talk of a recession, uh, certainly for larger companies, this affects public company employees certainly more than others. Okay, But if the recession really does begin to strain small businesses, then you're going to see an impact there. But you should have a plan at all times. Uh, the emergency fund is for those emergencies, but you should also have a plan, just like when we get on a plane to fly somewhere, George, and the fine flight attendants get up and, hey, if there is thing. a water landing, you know, here's what you do. And George never pays attention, so I have to pay attention for him. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it, it's like, do I have a plan? If I, if I had to have a water landing, if, if I was laid off, what would be my first three moves, Okay. Or you, you make up the number. But I think people don't do that enough. And so the point is, is like, all right, so do I have some relationships that I know I could call and I know that I'm pretty confident I can get a $15, $20 an hour job or I can get this or I've got something I could sell? Like, Start to plan like you would for a storm. And when the storm hits, you've got a plan. You've got an evacuation route. You've got water you know, per, you know, a non-perishable food, you know, that's the idea financially so that, uh, I mean, uh, professionally and occupationally so that if a layoff hits you, it's not a true emergency. It just sucks. Mm. And it's one reason to do this Ramsey plan because like Mitchell's right. situation, he goes, it's unfortunate, it's frustrating, yep. but I'm not freaking out either No, because I've got a pile of money in the bank. I don't owe people money and it changes how you make those decisions. So good wisdom there, Ken. Wishing the best for you, Mitchell. Thanks so much for calling in. That puts this hour of the Ramsey show in the books. My thanks to my co-host, Ken Coleman, all the folks in the booth. We got Austin, Ben, James, Zach, and Nathan. And you, America, thanks so much for listening. We'll be back real soon. 
Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. of Ramsey Solutions broadcasting from the pods moving and storage studio. It's the Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and your money. I'm George Campbell, host of the Entree Leadership Podcast, fine friend and co-host of Smart Money Happy Hour, joined by the host of the Ken Coleman Show, you guessed it, Ken Coleman himself, next to me, taking your calls on money, on career, on life, whatever's on your mind, America. Maybe you got some goals that you have set out for 2023, some resolutions. We want to help you get there and give you hope in every area of life. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. Anne kicks us off in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Anne, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi there. Happy New Year. How are you all? You as well. We're doing great. How can we help today? Good, good. Well, I have two questions for you. So the first one um, is how to approach my individual contributor role when I really don't have a desire to move up into management, although I do value recognition and achievement. And then my, my second question is whether or not it's a wise move to join the Air Force Reserves or the Air National Guard within the next year or two, um, knowing that the past two years have been full of a lot of change and a lot of trauma for me. So it's it's kind of a twofold question for you all. Okay, wow. Now we've got some real depth here. So let's let's go for number one first. Does that sound okay? Sure. That's great. So the heart of your question is what? I heard what you said. Okay, I want to grow or I want to be recognized. I love the way you put it. You want recognition, uh, but you don't want to be promoted into a leadership position. Am I understanding that? That is correct. I love growing accounts and I love earning more money and being wise with that money. But I don't necessarily want to move into a management role Um, Whereas my organization I'm at right now is run by former consultants who are really demonstrating that up or out kind of method of dealing with attrition. Um, And I'm also getting some uh, mixed messages from my direct manager who very kindly has said, I'm the best person on the team and she needs me, so she can't promote me. So I'm I'm getting some mixed messages. And what I really want to do is, you know, be the best individual contributor I can be and be wise with my money. Well, it sounds like that's really what I want to do. So it sounds like to me, the message that matters is your director is your direct uh, leader. And Mm -hmm, I would tell mm -hmm. that leader, hey, um, this is a match made in heaven because I don't want to lead. In fact, I get a little bit of of, of anxiety when I hear that these consultants and our leaders are kind of going up or out or whatever. I feel like I've gotten that message. But I got to tell you, I'm as happy as I can be in the role that I'm in, crushing it. And I want to get mm-hmm. more, I want to make more money and I want to make the organization more money. So I make more money so I can manage my totally. money. Well, I want to stay in this type of role. I'm happy to be your top performer. Please protect me because I don't want right. to be promoted into a leadership role. But this is what's weird about George, uh, our Western hemisphere, the way we, we treat promotions. It's like, well, you got to move up the ladder. Instead of going, what do you want to do more of? Do you want to make more money and do a little bit more of this? You know, why does it always have to be, I'm going to pull you out of the seat where you're crushing it and put you in a seat where you may not want to be. You may not want to lead people, but you might be the best salesperson. So they go, well, she needs to be over the sales team and lead them. So then you're miserable. mm -hmm. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I think the answer to number one is, reaffirm what your leader's telling you and going, I'm as happy as can be. Protect me and I want to stay here. All I want to do is is keep performing better, get paid more, and spend that money wisely. That's that's what mm-hmm. I think. Okay? You got that okay. one? I like that. I like it. Love it. Thank now, you. Now, <laughs> the, the second one, because I want George to jump in on this retirement thing, but I've got to ask, George, um, when you say you've been through a lot of change and trauma, Uh, whatever you're comfortable sharing, I'm just curious what that has been and how long that's been going on. 
Sure. No, I'm very happy to share. And there, there's actually some great changes in that, but also some some changes that were um, just a, a lot to deal with and heal with. So in the last two and a half years, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, I got sober. I moved across the country. Thank you. Thank you. I had a major surgery and a traumatic divorce. I lost over 110 pounds. I changed companies, and I was finally diagnosed and treated for ADHD. Wow. So lots of great things in there, but also yeah. lots of things that make me pause and say, okay, I want to make sure that I'm making the right decision because this would be like a 20, it didn't have to be a 20 year commitment, but I'm looking at a 20 year commitment in the reserves or the guard because it's important to me. I want to serve my country and do okay. something so beyond myself. All right. So that leads to what I was really going to dive into and let George talk about it as a retirement option. Sounds like to me, you want to serve your country more than you're just trying to juice your retirement benefits, but that is kind of a benefit, pardon the uh, the metaphor here. Is that what I'm hearing? I would say that's correct because I couldn't even tell you the dollar amount that those <laughs> that, that retirement would be. It's much more about serving my country. Um, also family lineage, my grandfather and my father both served, and this is really important to me. Would it stress you out, your current family relationship life? I know you're just recently divorced, and I'm so sorry about that. But would Thank this you. extra time uh, in serving our country, do you have margin for that to where it's not a negative would it affect other parts of your life, your job, anything like that? No. In fact, uh, at my job, most of us have served in some capacity. I'm also single and happily child free. Um, so I don't view it. I, know, I, I don't think it would. I mean, it would. Here's the truth. It would take away from my yoga on the weekends. That's what it would take away. From. We can live with that. <laughs> exactly. Namaste. Exactly. There you go. Namaste. Well, well, then I would wow. do it and yeah. I would do it for the I only reason too. that you want to serve your country and anything else right. is just an auxiliary benefit that's a nice to have, but I would never do it for the retirement yeah. benefits. And it Correct. sounds like based on what you told me, your heart is in the right place with this. Um, and I would pursue it if I were you. If that if that's what's uh, where your heart's saying to go, then the retirement benefit is just part of the package. Do you have retirement as part of your current job? I do. I do. Um, however, I've worked at startups for the last about eight years or so. Um, however, I've had very steady employment at startups, but we all know how startups go. So that's always kind of in the back of my head. Like I've got a great retirement, consistently putting 15% a year towards that. But I do feel a little bit behind. I didn't really get my first like grown up job until the last about eight years or so. So a little bit of it. Yeah, there is part of me that wants to make sure I'm playing catch up. But that's not the main motivator behind this. Are you debt free? I am. I'm debt free. I'm on baby step 3B right now. That's awesome. Fantastic. So soon you're going to be a homeowner. That's going to help you build wealth. What's your income? Yes, sir. Uh, 125. I make 125,000 a year. Oh, That's I awesome. love it. You are going to retire with yes. plenty of dignity and plenty of time to enjoy as much yoga as you can handle. <laughs> You'd probably That's be teaching the class by then, by based on how I'm yoga. talking. <laughs> well, we are so proud of you. Uh, honored to talk with you, Anne, and thank you in advance for serving this great country. What a cool call. A lot to, to manage there, Ken, but she's very well-spoken. And I, if I was uh, hiring, I'd hire Anne. Yeah. Sounds great. I, and I think, by the way, she said uh, learned ADHD, and she's... But, but there was a woman that Nothing's was highly stop focused... Her. And she's live and just rattling it off. And I think the serving is a great way to heal. Huge. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. Happy New Year to all of you listening out there. And while most of you are saying good riddance to last year because it was hard enough just to keep gas in your car and food in your fridge, uh, money's still tight. And you're wondering right now, is 2023 going to be any different? 
Well, guys, you do not have to live through another year of stress and worry, regardless of what is happening in the economy. And that's why I want you to watch Building Wealth in 2023, our free live stream event on January 12th, because we want to show you that you can still make progress on your goals. You can build wealth. You can have peace with money. Even in this crazy inflationary time, regardless of what's happening in the White House, you can do this stuff. So during this event, you're going to hear from myself, Dave Ramsey, Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, and Ken Coleman. We're going to talk about how to set goals and create margin so that you can build wealth this year. We're going to have some fun, and you're going to leave fired up for 2023. And even if the economy still feels out of control, you don't have to. You can control the controllable. So register for this free live stream. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash wealth. That's it's RamseySolutions.com slash wealth. Uh, George, I have a non-money question, but I think the audience uh, would They're like wondering. to weigh in on this. All right. All right. How long can you say Happy New Year? Ooh. At, at, at what point, in other words, at what date on the calendar in January, James, you can weigh in on this. James, our, our, our uh, fearless producer. What is the date by which the you window? go, you stop saying Happy New Year? Because everybody's saying Happy New Year, and I want to keep it going on the calls today. Is there a date? I've got a hot take, Ken. I think the further the relationship, the longer window you have. And I think 30 days is the longest window. Yeah. So friends and family, you get two days. I go January 15th. I think after the on the 16th, it's time to... We're, it's Drop it. We're all, we know we're all happy. Well, by then, I'm just learning to write 2023 instead of 2022. Yeah. What do you say, James? To me, like a couple days like oh a couple i'll say days. it to people at work today because it's the first day back seeing them but, yeah, but starting tomorrow if you see james in the wow. hallway yeah but okay. right. it goes to how, i don't have a like problem. you said how much you know the person if you don't know them very well and you're you're scraping the bottom you know, if it's of the, the teller the at the bank and it's january 17th they might say happy new year i That's have okay. the same question about that first email to somebody in a professional context of the new year like, at what point do you not say, hope you had a wonderful holiday season and your year's off to good start? Like, is it February 1? Yeah, holiday season gets a little tricky too, Ken. There's a lot of holidays. How yeah. long are we stretching the season for? Yeah. The older I get, folks, the crankier I get on this issue. I just think if you want to say Happy New Year, fine. Don't expect me to say it. You're turning this into a Seinfeld bit. What's the deal with Happy New Year? What are we doing? Well, I just How think long? we all know that we want you to have a Happy New Year. You know, I don't, I don't ever see somebody and go, crappy New Year. Who says that? Can I tell you something? This is embarrassing. I'm going to admit it to you in all of America. When I was young, I was a young kid. My grandma said Happy New Year, and I said back, no Happy New Year, and she cried. And I will never forget that moment. I've never felt How worse in my you? life. I don't know. I was probably 10, 11. Wow. Maybe 13. I got no clue. I was That's a punk. very emo. I was such a punk little emo yeah, kid. it is. And I still feel bad to this day. So, Grandma, if you're watching, Have I'm you written sorry. her a letter? I apologize profusely okay. through her tears, Ken. It was, oh, yeah. never do that to your grandma's, let alone anyone. You know what you're Be doing kind. there? You're owning your past and changing your future. Wow. Yeah, there it is. Plug in Dr. Free John Deloney's for book. Dr. John Deloney there. All right, before they take us off the air, let's get to a call. Yeah. Uh, it's a free one, 888-825-5225. <laughs> hey, that's important stuff. It was. Right? You're this right. Is, you call the show to talk about your life. And at the unnecessary Happy New Year's need to stop at some point. The only thing more important is Ashley's question, and she's waiting with bated breath That's in Huntsville, Alabama. I'll let it go. Ashley, I'm sorry, and Happy New Year to you. <laughs> hey, Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. How happy can we help today? New Year. Yes, yeah, so I had a question for you all today. Um, my husband and I just finished Baby Step 2. We started watching you guys last year. Um, ended up paying off our car loan early and some credit card debt. And so we're on Baby Step 3, um, currently saving about 10% for retirement while we fund our emergency fund. Um, but my question is, last year we ended up moving to a new primary resident. Um, we have about 400000 left on our $427,000 mortgage. Um, and we left our residence that we used to live in, put it up for rent, um, and we have about $150,000 left on that mortgage. Um, so I guess my question is, do we need to sell, because we've considered moving back to our old residence just to get rid of our big mortgage. Um, do we sell one of them to move to the other, or do we sell the rental? Um, and then my other question is, we're, my husband and I don't agree on whether or not we need to pay off our loan, because we have a low interest rate on both the primary and the rental house. Um, and so he kind of wants to keep it for that full 30 years, and I'd like to try to pay it off earlier. That's like saying, hey, do we want to keep getting punched in the face? Because we're not getting punched that hard in the face. So my take is that <laughs> I want to get rid of all debt. 
that's stealing from my income. And once you do that, you're going to have total control of every dollar coming into your household. So there's a few things here I just want to point out. Right now, you're doing Ashley's plan, which is fine. Uh, but you're asking for our advice, and that's going to be the Ramsey baby steps, which is we are saving up that emergency fund, and we're not investing a dime into retirement until that's fully funded. So okay. that's one. You said you were investing 10%. So I'll bring that 10% down to zero temporarily while we get the emergency fund in place. And on the housing okay. situation, could you guys move back into that rental? What made you move in the first place? Um, We were looking to get into real estate, into try to get some extra cash flow from a rental. Um, found a house we liked that was a little bit better because we're thinking about starting a family here soon. Um, so just wanted some bigger space. What's your household income? Um, right now, with both of our jobs, is $180,000, and then the rental is bringing in about 25000 Okay. And how much more space for this uh, little one? Um, We moved. It was about 1,200 square feet in our current home is now about 2,500 square feet. Okay. So it sounds like you need the, the extra space in the 2,500 square foot one. I mean, yes. Would it be tough to it, go back? It, it has been good to be bigger. Okay. It would be very tough to go back. Yes. Because based on the numbers, it sounds like you guys can healthily afford the mortgage payment making 180 a year, but I would sell the old one. I would never encourage anyone to have two mortgages at once. The way if you went back in time, I would say, hey, let's pay off your primary residence and then if you want to save up and pay cash for an investment property, you can do that. But right now, there's a yeah. lot of risk hanging around. You're trying to do 17 things at once, and you're not making the progress you should be making with your income. Okay. And, I mean, how much time have you all, have you all spent as a couple just talking through if you did what George told you to do? Like, what that windfall and how it would fast forward everything, how it would bring more peace? Have you guys sat down and really dreamed and kind of talked about what if? We have. We just don't agree. My husband's biggest thing is that we have such a good interest rate on both homes that he just thinks it's like wasting money to pay off the home in a sense. Well, I think that mindset um, is going to continue to hold you guys back when you look at, well, it's a low interest rate, so let's just keep it hanging around our necks for fun. So I get that. I get that that's his response, George. But, but, but I mean, are you sitting there going, how much money would you make on that house if you sold it? And what's it worth? We could... We could probably make at least two seventy to three hundred on it. Two hundred and seventy to three hundred thousand dollars. That's what you would make. Well, that would be the sale price of the home, and it, we have one hundred fifty k left okay. on the loan. So, so we you might could get one hundred fifty. One hundred fifty. Okay, but see, so yeah. that's the number. So if I'm sitting down with your hubs, and let's say I'm playing older brother with them, I'm going, okay, dude. You want to hang on to this house and you're making 25000 a year on it, but that doesn't include, I'm guessing that's your gross, that doesn't include expenses and upkeep. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. So you're not making 25000 All it takes is one roof to be replaced in an HVAC and so there goes all your profit. So let's just say, let's round down. Let's just say you guys are making eighteen on it, okay, net. Okay. Yeah. Versus the 150 after realtor's fees or whatever, let's just take those numbers. I'm looking at that going, what would that do for us? This dude's getting all excited about 18 versus I mean, 150 and no debt. My goal is to owe no one nothing, including the mortgage payments. His goal is to hang on to as much low interest mortgage debt as possible because that's somehow a path to building wealth. And so we fundamentally disagree in that regard. Uh, you can try to change his mind. You can go through Financial Peace University with him, read the total money makeover. That's our plan is complete freedom. Not let's try to be real estate gurus with a million dollars of debt hanging around our neck. Yeah, cast some vision about where that 150 would allow you to fast forward your life. He needs to see that. Mm. This is The Ramsey Show.
This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, Ramsey personality, joined by my colleague, Ken Coleman. And we are taking your calls at 888-825-5225. Now, many of you uh, have a goal to pay off some debt this year. And so we want to inspire you right now on the show with a debt-free scream. And to do that, we've got Dylan and Crystal joining us on the debt-free stage. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Yeah, Yeah, doing great. great. Where are you guys from? We are from Denver, Colorado. I love it. And how much debt did you pay off? We paid off $67,178. Wow. And how long did that take? About 28 months. Awesome. Wow. What was your range of income? Uh, we started out at 77000 and ended uh, around 107000 Awesome. What do you guys do for a living? Uh, so I am a nonprofit uh, program manager. and I worked in fraud prevention at a bank, um, but currently unemployed. Okay. Hey, uh, Dylan, do me a favor here. I'm producing the show all of a sudden. Pull that mic up closer. Yeah, to your we want to be able to hear you. My bad. There, there we go. We go. <laughs> hey, all guys, right. I got this, okay? It's Ken's okay. got it. Uh, I got it. I love it. So $67,000, what kind of debt was that? So it was a lot of student loans. Uh, we also had a car loan. And we had some credit card debt. I think that was yep. most of it, yeah. And uh, some money that I stole. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa, hello. Hold on. So you were in fraud prevention <laughs> At the bank. Did this happen while you were in fraud prevention? No, no, no. Okay. He's exaggerating. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Wow. So, the long story short, my mom had some money set aside for me for college, and she uh, trusted me with it. She, you know, wrote me a check, and I said, yeah, I'll use it just for school. And then I was unemployed for a little bit, and I started dipping into it a little too much. So, wow. I finally confessed and said, I need to pay this back. Whoa. Is she here with you? She is. She's right here. She's this right is not there. the first time she's hearing this, I assume. <laughs> no. no. Okay, nope. good. She seemed unfazed by this information, so I was hoping so. Yeah, so, okay, wow. okay. so that's what you mean by you stole it. Uh, yeah, I got Misused, you. yeah. yeah. Misused, He's yeah. not going to jail. No. no. Okay. no, no that's no, good. No. Paid that's, it all back. Yeah. Good. That's good. great. But that was a big turning point for us, so. Yeah, yeah. so what yeah. brought you to that I've had it moment where you guys said, we're doing whatever it takes to get rid of this debt? Yeah, so we were both raised the Dave way. We actually both did FPU as kids um, in our respective families. And uh, Dylan's mom is actually a coach, a uh, Ramsey coach. So oh, awesome. um, it's in it's in the family, but we both as young adults just made choices that sounded good to us, but weren't weren't wise. And so um, his, his thing being one of them. And um, when we were about to get engaged, that was really when we were having those big conversations about you know, what do we want our life to look like uh, when we're married? And so we started planning out before we got married how we were going to uh, move forward financially. Whoa. So how long have you guys been married? We got married uh, March of 2020, so almost three years. We got married right as the pandemic was happening. So we were one of those living room weddings. Um, yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yep, and yep. so soon after you got married, you were like, we're doing this plan. Yep. We got mm-hmm. to work. Yep. It worked out with the pandemic to where there was a lot of um, online food ordering. And so we did a bunch of DoorDash and uh, driving as dashers, not <laughs> not buying. Yes. Thank um, you for making yeah. sure people understood. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Just did a lot of side gigs. Um, I took a serving job at a restaurant a little bit later on. Um, he was working on finishing school as well. So yeah, we just hit the ground running. Wow. Yeah. And Sounds like you that. guys were pretty busy. We were. We were, yep. yeah. yeah. How'd you keep up that communication, the encouragement? Who walked alongside of you? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, we had so much support from our family and our friends, um, which really helped when we had to make those tough calls, you know, every every week when people wanted to hang out of, yeah, we can <laughs> we can do some stuff, um, but we can't do, we can't eat out all the time. Um, but yeah, we just, we had conversations all the time about here's what we're running after especially when we were tired. We were like, we need to go have a dreaming conversation. Mm-hmm. So we would go and dream about the kind of house that we want or the kind of um, travel we want to do. And that really helped keep us motivated. Yep. The life we want to live. Yep. And Dylan, I got to ask, your mom's a financial coach. Was she a part of this? Was she kind of like breathing down your neck or was it like, hey, mom, we got this? What was that situation like? Oh, man, she was amazing. She knew she just presented herself as a resource, but said, hey, I'm... You, it's a choice that you have to make, um, so I'll let you guys do your thing. But if you ever have any questions, let me know. And we definitely called on her a few times for, you know, do we do this or that kind of Wow. So decision. parents, if you're listening, that is how you do it. With mm-hmm. healthy boundaries, very gently, not forcefully. That's yep. incredible. Wow. And I'm sure she's proud because you guys went through Financial Peace as kids and it didn't quite stick the first time. What yep. do you attribute that to? Just kind of your youth of just like, well, this stuff doesn't matter. I'm not an adult yet. 
I was definitely one of those people that was like, I'll just have the, the credit card and I'll always pay it off. And I, I did. I never got into trouble with that. But I definitely, the wake up call for me was after my first year of my big girl job. I uh, did my taxes and saw how much I made. And I was like, I don't have that much in my bank account. Where, where did, did, where that did go? it go? Yeah. Oh so, my goodness. Yeah. And uh, you can speak for yourself. Uh, yeah. I just decided my parents didn't know what they were talking about with credit cards. So I got some and uh, just... They, you know, they, they talk about the free spender. I'm like nine out of 10 on that test. I woke up one day with like $26,000 in credit card debt. And I was like, I couldn't breathe. I was making less than that per year. Wow. And, uh, uh, yeah, I was having panic attacks. And eventually I had to call my parents and say, hey, I've hid this from you. Um, and I need help. Wow. Yep. How did that feel when you finally let that out and share, with that, share that with your mom and dad? Oh, man, it was... It's kind of like, you know, when you have to throw up, you have all this pain, but once it's out, it's like, oh, that was painful, but oh, I can breathe now. Yeah. Mm, that's a good analogy. You guys are different rough, people good than analogy. you were three years ago, five years ago. You've yeah. totally transformed. Has this affected yeah. your marriage too? Oh, absolutely. I think just having a common goal, um, having to make hard choices together, mm -hmm. we're both spenders. Um, and so we're often having to help each other stay on track um yeah. yeah and from the day that we got married uh we have always shared a bank account yep. i'm not we're not on anything that the other person's not on for that reason that's yep. great so how does it feel to be completely debt free oh it feels awesome <laughs> we can yeah, actually have a work. levity and chillness to you i'm like yeah we're just vibing right now yep we can yeah. actually work towards something now we we got ourselves out of the hole now we can now we can go up. Mm. So. so what would you tell people, that other couple that's out there, they have a pile of debt, maybe they went through financial peace and it didn't stick. What is the key to debt freedom? Yeah. Uh, so there's two things. There's like practical steps and then I guess emotional steps. For practicality, what we did is uh, we got one month ahead on our expenses. So our you know, our paychecks all, always go to our savings account. And then at the beginning of the month, we make a budget based on how much is in that account and transfer the money to our checking for all the bills and things. Um, so that's a practical thing that we do. Yeah. And then on the emotional side, like I said, just uh, keeping that dream central. Um, so constantly reminding ourselves why we're doing this um, because it, it makes it a lot easier to say no to the right now things if you're saying yes to the, the long time things. What are you willing to sacrifice now mm -hmm. for a better future? Mm. Yep. A great question to leave us with. That's you guys cool. are incredible. We are so proud of you. We're going to make sure you don't leave uh, today without the Live and Give box to gift to someone else, to use it for yourselves. It includes two of uh, Dave's best-selling books, Total Money Makeover and Baby Steps Millionaires. That's the next chapter in your story. And, of course, one-year membership to Financial Peace University. Maybe uh, it, you can show someone else who didn't stick the first time. You say, hey, go through this with us. We're going to lead a class, and the, this one's on us. We want to show you the way. Uh, so we'll make sure you guys get that. Thank you. We're so proud of you. All right, let's get to it. The moment we have all been waiting for. We've got Dylan and Crystal from Denver, Colorado. $67,178 paid off in 28 months, making seventy-seven up to $107,000. Door dashing and all. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, Three two, two, one. one. We're, We're debt-free! And the crowd goes wild yeah yeah it's fun it's fun to see you know it never gets old to watch people recount the journey and then the countdown is kind of the final moment where they break through you know the the ribbon and they just did it and that's what it's all about here's a young couple with their entire life in front of them favorite statement from the scream is when crystal said hey now we can work towards something mm. now they're dreaming if you live like no one else later you can live like no one else. That's going from surviving to thriving. That's what this plan's all about. Way to go, guys. We are so proud of you. And it's available to you, America, if you want it. It's there. It's on the other side of sacrifice and intensity and slashing expenses and making more money. But you do that for a short period of time, the rest of your life is going to be incredible. You can do this. This is The Ramsey Show.
listening to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined this hour by Ken Cole. Well, about this time of year, folks, we get flooded with calls because everyone is looking for a fresh start with their money, especially after a tough tough couple of years. So if that's you, you can't wish for things to change and expect it to happen. You've got to do some different things with your money. You've got to have a plan, and we can teach you that plan in Financial Peace University. This is the course that will help you rethink how you manage your money, and you're going to learn step-by-step how to pay off debt and build wealth. And nearly 10 million people have gone through Financial Peace University. They followed this plan and changed their lives. I am a recipient of that. This plan worked for me and it can work for you. Don't try to reinvent it. Don't try to do your plan. It just doesn't work. We've dialed this thing in. And when you intentionally follow this plan with a focus intensity, this year can and will be different. You're going to have more peace in your finances and your life. It's the best thing you can do this year for your money. Start Financial Peace University right now at RamseySolutions.com slash FPU. That's RamseySolutions.com slash FPU. All right, it is time for our question of the day. Randy emailed in from the great state of Arkansas. He writes, I am trying to decide if I should keep my job as assistant branch manager at a bank making $31 per hour or take a new job at a superior courthouse making $24 per hour as a legal process clerk. At the bank, I have to pay around $300 for health health benefits per biweekly paycheck. And the courthouse benefits are paid 100% by the court. Both jobs offer opportunity to grow. I'm 35 years old, married with two kids. What do you think I should do? Well, Randy, I think you should do the work or do the job that puts you on the ladder to grow where you really want to go. And this entire question seems like it's built on benefits, George, the cost of benefits. So you're the numbers guy, George. All right, so he's making $31 per hour right now at the bank, but he has to pay $300 for health benefits per biweekly paycheck. So I'm guessing now that's $600 a month. Is my math still correct, George? That sounds right. All right. So $600 a month. um, and $7,200 a year? $7,200 a year. The question is, is that that before or after taxes? My guess is that's before taxes. I would hope that's, that's the benefit. I don't know. But either way... Let's assume that. Let's assume that. But either way, you're looking at... $7,200. $7,200. So if we just take the 31 per hour and you you put that, you know, course of year, if he's just doing 40 hours a week and you play all that out, do the math on that, um, then you look at it from a an apples to apples. But I, I think he's still better off yeah, he's, he's in making, the bank situation. He's making uh, almost 15 grand more at the bank. Okay. So if you subtract, and again, I don't think it's... Minus the... He's, he's losing by moving to the courthouse, even yeah. though they're paying for the yeah. health So benefits. you've just got to look at the numbers. Because in one... Well, what happens is, is when you don't look at the big picture, George, then, then there's emotion instead of facts. The emotions go, ugh, I'm paying $600 a month yeah. for health care. And at the courthouse, I'd pay zero. Well, you're making a whole lot less. Yeah, I never want to make any decisions just based on a benefit alone. Never, ever, ever. That's my professional advice. Don't so take a job. Take the numbers off the table. solely on benefit. Would you rather be an assistant branch manager at a bank or would you rather be a legal process clerk? That's right. And which one are you better at? Which and one do you have more passion for? He, he puts in there that both jobs have an opportunity for growth. Well, again, let's look at them side by side. Where do each job? What? Where does each job take me? Okay, if I grow here on the bank side, where does that take me? If I grow here on the the courthouse side or, or whatever the city or municipality or the county, where does it take me? And which direction do I want to go? That's the decision process. And my guess, just a hunch, that in banking there is a higher trajectory for salary. Or there's growth. no question with the state or govern state or. Uh, uh, municipal government. Unless he's going to go yeah, go to law capped. school and become a lawyer, yeah. I think it's going to be tough to get to a, a much higher level of income. So he's 35 with two kids. I'm sticking with Me the too. bank job for now. And maybe that's not even the career path. Maybe there's something totally different out there for you. You got to explore that. Don't yeah. just settle because you go, well, it's, it's a good, safe job. I provide for my family. Go after something that really gives you the juice, as Ken would say. Oh, I love hearing you say that, George. Thank you. Great question. Thanks so much for emailing in. It's an open uh, open phones right now. 888-825-5225. Let's talk about your life, your money, your work, your purpose. Ian uh, is up next in Annapolis, Maryland. Ian, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. How can we help today? 
So my wife and I have been huge followers of Dave Ramsey for about the past 10 years. Uh, we're active, or I'm active duty Navy, and I have been for about 14 years now. And we move every three years. Now, my question for you guys is, right now we have finished baby step five. We have no debt. We have our daughter's colleges completely paid for. We're trying to figure out, is it better to buy a house or keep living in military housing and saving five grand a month? Uh, until we retire from the military. How many years would that be? Uh, so I have, I'm at 14 now. It'd be about six or seven at the earliest. And you're saving five grand a month? Uh, ex- not including our 20% to our TSP or our 401k. Wow. So on top of that, you just have five grand in cash you can put in a savings account every month. Yes, sir. So we're putting it right now, we're putting about three grand into our non retirement account and we're putting about 2000 to 2500 in our money market account. Cool. And the non-retirement is that, that being invested you're saying in a brokerage account? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, S&P 500. So just our, we're putting 3 grand to a just a S&P 500 and we're putting about 2000 to 2500 every month into our money market. Essentially just a savings account. Yes, sir. Okay. So you've got an index fund growing over there. You've got the savings account. I think there's there's a lot of wisdom there. And you're saying, hey, five to seven years from now, this money could turn into 300, 500 grand. Damn. Yes, sir. Right? And paying cash for a house. I love that plan. And what's, yes, what's we, the other side of the coin here? Uh, so we move every three years. Obviously, we, we, we bought a house at our last command. Absolutely loved it. Uh, we did really well with selling. I uh, just didn't put that money into our index. And now we're, you know, we have about a year and a half left until we move again. And we're just trying to figure out, everyone's telling us, obviously, buying. Buying has done really well for us in the past. Uh, but right now we're happy in military housing. We don't pay bills. We don't pay utilities. Uh, we're just trying to figure out, are we making a mistake uh, living I, in military housing? I don't no. think you're making a mistake. No, you're, you're, you're making the wise decision. Because five years from now, yes, you're paying sir. cash for a house while the rest of the goons who are making fun of you yeah. are paying off their 30-year mortgages. And I, so, yeah, I don't know who these goons are that would be making fun of you. I mean, this is brilliant. This is... Well, sir, and, yes, sir. And today, is mil- a lot of military people from what I've met, um, they buy houses everywhere they go and they rent them out. So everyone around us is telling us we're making a mistake being in military housing and we should be buying and... They think it's a life hack because they haven't gotten burned by playing this game. And uh, you you simply don't need to play the game, regardless of what profit they say they're making, uh, because all it takes is one emergency scenario where they've got to pay the HVAC or the roof or the renter stops paying or there's another pandemic and it's illegal to evict and your tenant doesn't pay. So this is is a dangerous situation uh, when you've got a mortgage attached to it. And so I would keep going the route you're going, even if you bought and uh, once you move a year and a half from now, you want to buy in the next place and you hold on to that for three years. You would be totally fine. I don't think there's any yes, a lack of wisdom in that hey, either. Ian, I got to ask you this very quickly. Did we say anything that you didn't have that you hadn't already thought of before you called the show? Absolutely not, sir. No. Everything you guys said just reaffirmed it. Right. So uh, here's my point. My... You needed you needed a shot of confidence. Yes, and sir. I'm telling you, you got it. You yes, sir. are a wise young man. You have to drown out all these other people. You got to decide what life you want to live and live yes, it. Sir. That's exactly what I need. Like you guys just, re- we, you reaffirmed it yesterday. We, re- we listened to you the entire day and we just, we figured it'd be best to hear from you guys directly. So glad you called and Man. thank you for your service. Yes, You're a great you American. So much. Wow. What a sharp guy. That gave me a lot of encouragement. And it also reminded uh, me, Ken, like you mentioned, drown out all the noise, all the negativity. Everyone's saying you're doing it wrong. If you are living your life with the goal of complete debt freedom, where your income, your greatest wealth building tool stays with you, that is a great plan in good times and bad. So I'm sticking with that plan. I'm taking that to the bank. That puts this hour of The Ramsey Show in the books. My thanks to my co-host, Ken Coleman, all the folks in the booth keeping the show afloat, and you, America. Thank you so much for listening in. Share the show if you enjoyed it with, with a friend, someone who needs to hear this message, and we'll be back real soon. Hey, folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts.
live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studio. It's The Ramsey Show, where America hangs out to have a conversation about your life and more money. I'm George Camel, joined this hour by my friend Ken Coleman, best-selling author and host of The Ken Coleman Show. And we're here for you, America, to help you kick off the new year strong, help you achieve your goals, whether it's professionally, financially, relationally, you name it, we are here for you. The number to call is 888-825-5225. Johnny is kicking us off in Denver, Colorado. Johnny, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. What's going on with you? Well, uh, to keep it simple, I have about $40,000 in credit card debt that I'm looking to erase as soon as possible. Um, But it's really difficult because I only make around $45,000 after tax. And I owe so much credit card debt and all my credit cards are over the limit that the interest alone is almost the exact amount of any minimum payments I'm able to make on a monthly basis. Mm. Uh, So just as of right now, I just don't know how I'm ever going to even make a dent in this because any payments I do make, the interest all but absorbs it. And I make like no progress. What is the range of the interest rates on these cards? Um, They're 25 to 29%. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. What are you doing for work? Uh, I am a appraiser, just like a valuation analyst for commercial real estate. Can you work overtime in that role? Uh, It's a salaried position, so it's a full-time gig already. I work like maybe 40 to 50 hours a week, but um, it's salaried, so uh, 25% of my overall earnings are going towards like benefits, insurance, um, 401k savings, Roth IRA accounts, um, et cetera. What other debt do you have other than the 40,000? Other than the 40,000 in credit card debt, that's, that's really just it. So no car loans, no student loans? Um, I have $13,000 in student loans, but I'm really just hoping that the Biden administration would just kind of wipe that away for me. You are going to be hoping to the grave, my friend. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, I I want to go ahead and give you some breaking news. All right. Uncle Joe and no president, any party is going to forgive student loans. It's big business for them. They're not going to do it. It's an empty political promise. I'm just here to tell you, I want to bash that so that we can move on to getting out of this debt. You got it? Yeah. All right. So any other debt you want to tell us about? We got 53 total right now. Okay. Uh, No, that's it. Just the the student loan that I was hoping would just disappear on its own. But uh, now that you're saying not, okay, then it's 53 total. Now, uh, are you a new listener to the show? Yes, I just uh, found your guys' YouTube channel about a week ago. Oh, welcome. Awesome. Welcome aboard, sir. Welcome to uh, this weird bunch of crazy. So here's here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk you through uh, the baby steps. You're in baby step one right now, trying to get $1,000 saved in the bank. Do you have $1,000? Yes. Okay, great. How much left over after the $1,000 do you have? Do you have more than that? Uh, after I take away $1,000, i would be left with 1000 Okay, so you've got a thousand left over. How much are you investing right now? Um, no more investments. I pulled out all of my investments to pay off some of my credit card debt, and uh, like you pulled from your retirement. No, 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 I don't really have a retirement account aside from my four hundred one k and Roth accounts. Okay, um, so you didn't um, touch was, those. No, I didn't touch those. Okay, so where you said you pulled it? Where did it go from? Uh, I pulled it from like my stock accounts that I'd started when I was in high school. I okay. accrued a couple thousand, but then when the credit card debt became too much, I just pretty much pulled it all out to make payments towards the credit cards. Um, but then the interest kind of just like went way overboard. So what are the minimum payments right now across your credit cards? Uh, so the minimum payments across my credit cards, I have three um, big ones. It's 300, 300, 500, pretty much around 1,200 uh, minimum every month. Okay. And you're able to make those payments, but the balance keeps growing? Yeah, I'm able to make those. Yes. So to clarify, I'm able to make the minimum payments on a monthly basis because I pull in around 3,900 monthly, but the interest is so high, or again, like around 25 to 29% that the minimum payment on one card is 300 and then the interest is 303. Mm. Have you looked into refinancing any of that debt to a lower interest? I had thought about looking into it, but I'm kind of 
discouraged because one of the options was like a credit transfer card that might be able to absorb all of the credit card debt that I have into like a zero interest card. But research indicates that I probably need like a minimum 670 credit score to even qualify for one. And due to the damage over the last three months because of the fact that all of these cards are over the limit anyways, I don't have enough of a high enough credit score to okay. even consider getting a, a transfer a credit transfer card. How much time do you have? George is going to keep walking you through this, but I just got to ask, how much time do you have or could you make to work extra doing another job? Well, I work full-time during the weekdays. I could definitely work on the weekends. If and I evenings. And you work evenings. a few yeah. evenings? Uh, well, it's a nine to six gig. Um, so pretty much, uh, if I, if I don't sleep, yeah, I could yep. work evening. Yep. You, you can do it. You can, uh, at six o'clock, you go, uh, you go eat yourself a ham sandwich in the car that you, and that you made do and three hours of Uber three hours and of work, man, you have got to get some income in to pay off these cards. And the good news is you can do that. Okay. Okay. This this is a mountain in front of you, but you're going to start clawing away at this thing as you create more margin. And so what you're going to do is get on a written plan, a budget. I'm going to gift you one year of every dollar premium to help you with this. You're going to list out your income minus all of your expenses. That should equal zero. Every dollar has an assignment. Once you do that, you're going to look at your bank statement and go, okay, what are every single one of my expenses? And then you're going to be brutal in cutting every single thing that doesn't just help you survive right now. And so we're not eating out, we're cutting our subscriptions, we're cutting all the luxuries, we are covering our four walls, which is food, utilities, shelter, transportation. That's pretty much it. And you're in whatever your insurance premiums are. Everything else is kind of a want beyond just putting basic food on the table, right? Right. And so if you do that, I want to know how much of a raise you're going to give yourself of that $3,900 you are taking home. The goal is to say, hey, how do we get 2000 of that th being thrown at the credit cards? How do we get 2500 of that thrown at the credit cards? And if you need to go make more income to get it to 4500 take home, then let's go do that for a season to get rid of this. Because we meet people all the time who make your income, who have your level of debt. And they can do this stuff, and you can too. The issue you're running into is the interest rates making it feel insurmountable. But as soon as you start clawing away at that, you get the balances lower, uh, we're going to be able to cover this. And communicate proactively with these companies and say, hey, here's what I can pay. I can't get away from this right now. And some of them may go to collections, but your goal is to try to clean this up as fast as possible. I'm going to also gift you Financial Peace University. Watch all nine lessons. Start doing that every dollar budget, and you're going to feel a sense of peace, a sense of hope, a sense of confidence about your future. You can do this, man. Call us back when you're debt-free and share your story, and hang on the line. Austin's going to pick up and get you those gifts from us. This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined this hour by Ken Coleman. And uh, if you don't know about Ken Coleman, go check out The Ken Coleman Show on Aww, The Ramsey Network. Thank you, George. Wherever you listen to podcasts, on YouTube, he's everywhere. Let me tell folks what it is since yeah, you said they it. don't know what it is. Yeah, it's about work. The name right? isn't that descriptive. So Ramsey Solutions is about money. It's about relationships and work, and I'm the work guy, and uh, we're about more than just work and a job. The idea is, is do you know what your full potential is? And then what does it take to meet that full potential? So it really is, if you're growing personally, I got good news for you. You're growing professionally. Mm. 
And so we're trying to help you really figure out that unique role where you're making great money and you're making a great contribution to the world. So that's what I focus on. And we take those kind of questions here on the show. So thanks for sharing that. The Ken Coleman Show uh, is where you can join us for a conversation over there and all the stuff. Well, uh, producer James sent us this article that has to do with work. And I wanted your hot take on this, Ken. Here's the headline from Yahoo. Here's the headline. Should I take a lunch break at work? One in four Gen Z employees worry leaving their desks to eat is a bad look to the higher ups. Here's why that's nonsense. So it goes on to explain, probably, um, hopefully, something well, sure. close to our take. I, let me answer the question. Yes, you should take a lunch break. Um, if you are in a place where you taking a lunch break is actually frowned upon, I don't mean like in your head, and this data is saying that a lot of Gen Z workers are worried that it looks bad. Well, there's a difference between I'm worried, I'm manifesting this thought that's not true, and it actually being true. So if, George, you are working in a place where your leader is frowning upon it, making passive-aggressive comments about you taking a lunch hour, you shouldn't be there much longer. Find you another place, uh, and here's why. The data bears out that you're not actually more productive. You may think you're getting more done, but it's going to end up being a negative for you by not getting up from your desk. And a lot of these kids, I, I looked at the art, a lot of these young people are eating at their desk. They're called desktop diners. Desktop in diners. It's a fun little nickname. We got a name for everything. First it was quiet quitting. Now we got desktop, desktop diners. diners. Um, I, I, I think it's good for your mental health. It's good for your uh, physical health. Uh, to get up, change locations. You know, there's all kinds of data about uh, walking for 10 to 15 minutes before you have a big meeting. I've talked about that on the Ken Coleman show. You know, it's a it's a creative release. Uh, it allows you to kind of get some perspective. And uh, so anyway, the lunch break is the same idea. I, you know, I got I have several friends here in the building that they go work out during lunch. Mm. Uh, Damon Gald, my fearless brand leader, works out during lunch, and it shows. It shows. Um, and you know, in multiple ways. So, you know, I do think that there's something to that. And I'm, I'm calling myself out on this because sometimes I go without lunch. You're known uh, to do that. I'm known to well, do that. It's a, has, that has a cool name too, Ken. It's called fasting now. I'm intermittent fasting. That's what I tell it's people. It's real trendy. What it really is, is that, uh, I have poor planning and, uh, you know, I don't have time, uh, but I need to make time. But now for me, uh, I keep my energy up during that time. But if for someone every day to be sitting there feeling like I can't leave my desk or else someone's going to fire me or they're going to think poorly of me, I'm That's telling ridiculous. you something, young people. You have, you've you got to get some facts to support that. And if you don't have any facts, you need to get over that uh, and just be responsible. Be responsible. Well, and that, the report that this study talks about found that stopping to eat and taking mental breaks can prevent burnout, especially in the context of the extra stressful times workers yeah. have faced over the past few years. And so if you think you're being more productive, you're actually being less productive and you're on your way to burnout if you can't take that break. That's right. Your, your mind needs a, a, a break. You know, your body needs the break. It's get up, you know. Uh, and by the way, if I'm a young professional... If I'm going to eat out every day, and you, some of you need to not be eating out, you need to pack your lunch and go to a local park. But you know what I'm trying to do? I'm making phone calls to people I want to connect with. I'm eating lunch with people I want to connect with. I'm using that time to grow professionally, but I'm away from my desk. Absolutely. And it's actually discouraged here at Ramsey. If we see a team member yeah. eating at their desk, we're going, hey, what's going on here? You go, we have got a whole cafeteria where we can yeah. connect with team members. Yeah. And occasionally you'll have a lunch meeting or something like that. By the way, no one else wants to smell your tuna fish sandwich for the rest Thank of you the for afternoon. Calling that out. Can we can we just let's be real practical for a moment? Especially in the microwave. Oh, yeah. We gotta avoid microwave fish in twenty twenty three. You wanna win professionally, don't bring fish to the office cafeteria. Not the advice we thought we'd hear on the show, but it's the it's the advice we got. Sometimes so thank it you, just Ken. presents itself and you have to give it's it. Perfect. <laughs> I love it. Well, take your breaks, folks, for safety's sake. There we go. All right, let's get to the phones. 888-825-5225 is the number to call. Renee is joining us up next in Seattle. Renee, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. How can we help today? So I work part-time. I've been at my company for about four years now, and I'm wondering, should I keep contributing to my employer 401k, or should I start contributing to my Roth? Oh, do you have a Roth 401k option at work? Or is it just a traditional? 
It's, uh, I have, just my job offers the traditional, but I do have a Roth with nothing in it that I have uh, with Fidelity. You have a Roth IRA with Fidelity, and then you have a traditional yes. 401k with your employer. Yes. Okay, awesome. And are you debt free? No, sadly. What kind of debt do you have? Uh, the biggest burden would have to be our credit card. Mm. How much credit card debt do you have? Uh, 23, wow. 23K. Any other yeah. debt? Um, car loan, house. Okay. So let's just focus on the student loans, uh, the, the credit cards, and the car loan. If we focus on those two, what does all that debt add up to? So the credit card and the car loans, that probably adds up to, I'm almost done paying off one car. It'll be paid off next year within six months. So we're talking 50 grand in debt total? I would say 50. Okay. Let's get some hard numbers on that and let's be about the business of paying that debt off before we continue investing. And here's why. How much are you investing right now as a percentage? 3%. 3. What if I told you we can get you to 15%? That's 5x your, your investing rate, correct? Right. And so you can do that once we get rid of these payments because add up all these payments in your life and go, hey, what if I could have invested that money instead pre-tax in my traditional 401k? Mm-hmm. Now we're talking. Now you can retire with dignity. So that's the baby steps that we teach is baby step two, paying off all consumer debt using the debt snowball, smallest to largest. Then we're saving up a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses to create a financial foundation because now we don't owe anyone anything except for the house, and you've got a pile of money in the bank for emergencies, which means you don't have to ever turn to the credit cards as a crutch again. You feel that? Yes, that would be nice. Then we have the margin to invest 15% Mm. of our household income into retirement. So now let's talk about that. Once you're there, which I think you'll get there in no time, what's your household income? Um, About 97K. Okay. So you absolutely can pay all of this debt off with focus intensity, pausing all investing, and finding that margin, cutting expenses down. You can do this in under two years, right? I believe I can, and I'm actually looking for a remote job to kind of help with the debt. Okay. Well, increasing income is only going to help. And then when it comes to the investing strategy, this is how we see it. Match beats Roth beats traditional. So do you have an employer match? Yeah, I do, actually, and that's what I've been contributing to. My employer match is 2%. Great. So we're going to invest, once you're there, you're debt-free with a fully funded emergency fund, we're going to invest 2% into that 401k to get the match. That's 100% return because it's free money, right? Okay. Then we're going to move to all of our Roth options. So you mentioned the Roth IRA, so you could fully fund the Roth IRA. And then if you still have money left over with that 15%, rule, then we can go back to the traditional 401k and invest the rest there. Okay. The money I already have in the 401k, should I roll it over to the Roth? No, just leave it in there. Okay. Only roll it over if you uh, leave that employer for any reason, then you could do a direct rollover to a traditional IRA so it doesn't trigger any tax penalties or burdens there. So you're doing great. Let's just do things with intensity and with focus in order, and you're going to be back to investing 5x in no time. We are rooting for you, Renee. Please call us back if we can help in any other way. More of your calls coming up, 888 825 This is The Ramsey Show. This is The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, co-host of this show, of course, but also Smart Money Happy Hour, which you can check out on The Ramsey Network. Join this hour by my good friend Ken Coleman, host of The Ken Coleman Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. We're taking your calls about money, career, life, work, purpose, and everything in between. 
Jason joins us up next in Houston, Texas. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Great. How are you? How can we help? Yeah, I was just hoping I could get some uh, career advice today. You came to the right place, my friend. All right, thank you. So um, kind of just a little bit of background. Um, I graduated with my MBA um, end of August last year. And kind of just to pay my way through school, um, I worked at a, it's like a telehealth consulting firm, kind of working in their call center division. And it's kind of like an inside sales um, representative position, um, you know, making out on calls all day. And it's a very metrics driven position. And fortunately, I've been able to do pretty well at it and, you know, was able to get a pretty nice bonus every month. And that's really helped me, you know, graduate debt free. Now, the company is saturated. I did have one interview for, you know, an account manager position. And unfortunately, I didn't get um, the role. And there's not a lot of other job openings there. And at the same time, I'm quite burnt out in my current role. And, you know, kind of overqualified. I feel like my potential is being limited. So I guess my question is, should I just jump ship and, you know, devote myself full time to the job search? Or should I just continue keeping working this job? Um, and kind of try, I guess, I don't know, try to lay off on the burnout and keep pushing through it. Well, it's, it's a bit of both. And I don't want you jumping ship, but I do want you looking, uh, for another better opportunity and you Mm -hmm. really know what you're looking for. Uh, I believe, or I can tell you this by what you just said, I know that you know what you're not looking for. And Mm -hmm. so that really should arm you with some confidence. But I want you spending every waking hour when you're not working, because I don't want you stealing from your current employer, but you're treating this with super high priority because I don't want you to burn out. And I think you can hang on long enough because you've got a very clear mission. And your mission is, I've got to replace my current job. The only way I would tell you to jump ship without a job is if you had the financial ability to do so. And I don't think that's your case. Um, well, I mean, I have saved up, you know, quite a bit of money. To How much? Where, um, I would say about, I think by the time, like, if I do plan on quitting, when I'm thinking I'll have at least maybe 15K saved up. Do you have debt? Yeah. No, I don't have any debt right now. Is the 15, um, what is your emergency fund? Um, is that your emergency question. fund? The 15? No, I mean, see, I'm kind of in a position where I'm kind of living at home and so my expenses are pretty low. Um, and but you're saying you'd have you know, 15K to your name? Yeah. Let's call total. it that. It's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. What, right. if, what, if, what if it takes mm-hmm. you 60 days to get the job you want? Right. I don't want you dipping into that because you don't have to, unless the, again, I don't think you qualify for the, well, I'm financially set and I can take two, three months without any income. I don't think you're there. Not by my standard. And I don't think by Mm -hmm. your standard, if you really look at it. And I'm glad that you have the safety of having um, very little expenses, but why burn through any of that 15,000 when you don't have to? Yeah. The only uh, thing now that I would say is if you're in a truly, like your doctor's going, I'm advising against you going in there because it is that damaging to your health. Right. And I don't think that's the case either. But I think with, with you going, all right, I'm not happy here. I know why I'm not happy here. And now I'm free to go find something. I know what I'm looking for, and I'll, I'll help you. I'll give you my Get Clear assessment. I'll give you the book sure. from Paycheck to Purpose. Both of those are my gift today, all right, to help okay. you with further clarity so that you can confidently move forward. Clarity mm-hmm. is the key to confidence. Okay, yeah. And so I want you clear on what move you're going to make next. In other words, George, I'm, I'm working right now on a, on, a, on a smaller book on this, and the outline is, and this is for you, Jason, it's mm-hmm. why to quit. You've laid out the why. Then we've got to figure out where to quit. Then we say, once we know the where, we figure out, okay, what's the when? And that's pretty much determined, right, by uh, the opportunity, and we understand that. And then finally, how to quit, doing it the right way and not burning bridges. That's your process right now. You've got the why. We need to figure out the where, and then the when and the how will take care of itself. Mm, How old are you, Jason? Oh, I just turned 30. (laughs) Okay. 
My goal yeah. for you also would be to get your own place, your own apartment, maybe yes. with a roommate, but uh, move away from mom and dad and, and give yourself that dignity where it is on you and you feel like sure. an adult. And so I would be aggressively looking for that next job, get that lined up, save as much money as possible because life's going to get expensive when you're on your own. So that would be my next goal. Sure. Just stack up a giant pile of cash and get that job uh, that you actually want versus just doing this one because the money's good yeah. and it's safe. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we don't want you I'll touching think... that money, Jason. Don't touch the 15000 unless it's a true emergency. I want you finding something else to step into, and I'm going to give you the tools to help you get further clarity. Yeah. Hang on the line. Austin will pick up. We'll make sure to get that over to you. Thanks so much for the call. All right. Jacqueline joins us in Fort Worth up next. Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you. I got a chance to speak to you and Ken back in March the 28th of last year. Oh, fun. Um, How you been since then? He said George on my mind, but it was uh, Ray Charles, not Jane Brown. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Well, thank you so much for calling in. How can we help today? Okay. Now I have, I'm debt free except for my house. At that time I had debt and I told you I'd be out of debt. So Love and, it. Um, I had a buyer for my house. Nice. About 10 days before we got ready to close, they disqualified to uh, have the loan any longer. Mm, so the financing fell through. So, yeah, their financing failed. So I am here waiting. I reduced my house uh, uh, about 20000 trying to keep up with the market, and um, I got my stuff in boxes, and I'm not going to be moving out until I sign some paper on the dotted line. But the thing is, my question is, um, with the market going the way it is, I guess you would have to continue to be competitive with the market to keep going up or down or whatever. Sure. What's your question? The question is, in order to sell the house when you got competition around you, is it, I'm not going to go for solo, is it necessary to kind of go with the market with the sale of the house and the value of the house? Well, you can have a, you can have a, a threshold and say, hey, I'm not going below this. Yeah. If that's the case, I'm staying here, and I'll just keep living here until the market's back up. And that could be a long time. Yeah. We just don't know. Uh, we, you know, we don't have a crystal yeah. ball here. Are you working with a really good real estate agent? Uh, I think I have a good real estate agent. He's the same one that um, told me to purchase the house that I'm in now. Okay. You can always um, get a second opinion. The first time opinion. we like, within a week. Yeah. Well, you can get in touch with one of our endorsed local provider real estate agents. They're Ramsey Trusted, and uh, these people sell a lot of homes. They are the pros, and there are some in the Fort Worth area that would be happy to give you a second opinion on this. Uh, you don't have to work with them if you don't want to, but I think we need a second opinion here because I, if the house isn't moving and you've already dropped it by 20000 well, something else is wrong. It's, it's off the market now. We're down to 20000 It went online. It wasn't on the market at line. We took it off the market to kind of... Um, well, hard to sell a house when it's off the market, stuff. isn't it? It's off the market now, but we're going to put it back on the market this month. Okay, I might wait. I might get in touch with a real estate endorsed local provider at RamseySolutions.com and see what they say, because I think you've, you've got a marketing issue. You may have a pricing issue. We just don't know without looking at the details. But you need someone who is a high-octane real estate agent to help you move this house at the price you want to move it for, and I absolutely think they can help you do it. So thank you so much for the call. Wishing the best for you with this home sale so you don't have to have those boxes laying around too much longer. This is The Ramsey Show. Welcome back to The Ramsey Show. I'm George Camel, joined by Ken Coleman this hour. 
Our scripture of the day comes from Proverbs 11, 3. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Henry Ford once said, quality means doing it right when no one is looking. Love that, Ken. That reminds me of our Ramsey core value, excellence in the ordinary. Mm. You That's went a little stuff. deeper. It reminded me of how you do your hair. What's that? When no, everyone's that looking. No, everyone. Nobody's looking when you're, and you are really precise about it. Thank you. Uh, we, we had the, I had the privilege of being on a uh, retreat with you. Oh, that's right. And you here we are see it at in the action. Light. No, I didn't see it. I heard it. You yeah. heard the blow dryer going. Before we head out on the boat, this guy doing a 10 minute, get his hair right routine before we go on the boat. And to me, I thought that's what it made me think of. No Excellent. one was watching you, but boy, it is. It is well coiffed. The higher the hair, the closer to God. Is that what the rule yeah. is? I think Dolly Parton said that. I don't know. <laughs> That's how Dolly I live my life. Parton. You know, I interviewed her once. Really? Yeah. I'll tell she you. She seems very pleasant. Yeah, very nice lady. Awesome. Well, let's get to what you're, you're here for, America, and that is the calls, 888-825-5225. Ava joins us from Springfield, Illinois. Ava, welcome to the show. Hi, um, I have a question. I have about half a thousand dollars in savings and cash, and I'm aware how to like get a job. And I've done some side jobs like babysitting and gift wrapping, and I make about over a hundred or two hundred dollars each time. But I want to know how can I set up good financial habits before experiencing debt, and how to know whenever I should spend money on things that I want and hanging out with friends or just on savings. How old are you, Ava? Almost 14. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. That's incredible. Wow. You know that you are so much smarter <laughs> than most 24-year-olds I met, 34-year-olds? <laughs> Thank you. Where did you learn this stuff? Like, where did this mindset come from and this work ethic? Um, I watch the Dave Ramsey show with my dad, and they, my parents kind of teach me how to use money wisely. Nice. That's incredible. Well, they're raising you well. We appreciate you being a listener. So let's get to your question. So you said you have how much in the bank right now? Um, I have about over 100 in the bank and then over 250 in cash. So 250 cash, 100 in the bank. What is your next financial goal? Um, probably saving for a car. Wow. Okay, so a few years from now, let's, you're, you're almost 14. You're mm -hmm. driving by what, 16? Illinois? Yeah. Okay. So in mm -hmm. two years, how much money do you think you could save up if you kept this up? Maybe, you know, you, you go get, uh, I don't know the age limits and requirements in Illinois, but could you go get a job somewhere at 14 years old? Uh, yes, most likely. On top of your gigs doing babysitting and gift wrapping and all that? Because gift wrapping is pretty seasonal, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, but the babysitting is where the bank is. I've got a 14-year-old daughter named Josie, <laughs> Ava. So you guys are, you two are close mm -hmm. in age, and uh, she's making pretty nice money. What are you getting for uh, babysitting? What's, what's the, hourly, what's the rate? hourly rate? Um, depending on the family, one family pays me twenty an hour, and other families pay me ten. Or sometimes I just get twenty dollars or forty. Wow. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to try to find me about five more $20 an hour families. That's the first thing. All right. <laughs> Do you enjoy it? I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy yeah. it? Yeah. I. Oh, yeah. I love hanging out with the kids. And it's flexible. You can do it kind of on your own schedule right now. Because are, are you in school as well? Uh, yes, I am in school. So you're limited to kind of uh, some evenings, weekends. I'm sure on school nights, it's a little harder. Mostly weekends? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, awesome. mostly weekends. I love it. Well, I would set a goal. Have you talked to your parents about uh, if they are going to be contributing to this car? Um, so my brother, my oldest brother, he had a little bit donated to him, but he had to get a job and save up for it. So my parents could afford to help me, but we usually have to pay on it on our own sure. so that we can learn how to save money. When you say pay on it, do you mean with payments? Um, no, with cash. Okay, good. Oh, yeah. I want to make sure we're paying Ramsey cash. This is a Ramsey girl. Man. Good. Oh, come on. All right. So maybe pitch this. Say, hey, Dave Ramsey, here's what he did with his kids. It's called the 401 Dave plan where I'm going to save an amount and you as mom and dad will match whatever I save up to a certain limit. So you might say, hey, if I save up up to $3,000, will you guys match me dollar for dollar up to another 3000 That would give me $6,000. You think they would do that? Okay. Um... 
I could ask. I don't know. That's your homework right there is have that conversation with mom and dad. Now, if they say, no, we're not giving you a penny, then it's on you. And so it may, be, it may take a little longer, it may take more work to get to that 6000 instead of three. But that's a great goal to have on top of also enjoying your life as a 13-year-old girl and hanging out with friends and going to the mall. I don't know what the kids do these days. What do you do for fun, Ava? Yeah, I hang out with my friends. Are malls still cool? Can you just tell me? Stuff. This is de- uh, this is deteriorating, Ava. I'm sorry. I'm going to rescue him. He doesn't I'm have trying to kids. Help. I'm helping yeah, but America. I'm, I'm the father of teens, all right? <laughs> no, hanging out at the mall, it's not cool, George. That's me and James hang out at the mall all the time. Well, look at you two. So, need, need I say to you? <laughs> Gosh. Uh, Ava, here's the deal. I think, this was, I think George is giving you great advice on laying it out with mom and dad. Whatever amount they gave to your brother is probably what they're going to consistently do for you. So take that amount. And then what I want you to do, which is really powerful for for, uh, young people and adults, is when we're Mm -hmm. saving for something big, is to visualize that. And I think it'd be fun for you to spend some time with mom or dad uh, on the used car market, you know, online, and just get an idea of some cars that you think are are, are cool or cute or whatever a 13-year-old girl would call it, but a car that you like, and you begin to see um, how much that car costs. Your mom and dad will say, well, that's got too high of a mileage or whatever, but begin to just get familiar with it. Now, in two or three years, the used car market may change a little bit, but by and large, it's going to give you an idea because I want you to be able to know, okay, I mm-hmm. think I want 8000 or I think 10000 or I'm going to be okay with five. I think to have that visual and a very specific financial number is going to be huge for you. And then you can go get a job maybe at your grocery store or a fast food place or whatever, plus babysitting. And then you start to go, all right, how long is it going to take me to save up this amount of money? And before you know it, you're going to be there. Oh, yeah. And Ava, it already sounds like you never want to touch debt. Is that correct? Yeah. That is the number one factor to your financial success is if you never touch debt, you never open a credit card. Maybe once you turn 16, you get the car, you open up uh, a debit card at your local bank or credit union and use that to start paying for your car expenses, for gas, for food and all of that as you get, you know, maybe a job while you're in high school. And that's going to set you on a path for success. If you have that mentality that debt is off the table and when it comes to college or further education, we're not going to go into debt. We're going to whatever we can save up in cash. That's how we're going to explore education and that's how I'm going to explore my next car and the next thing you are going to be so far ahead of most of America it's going to be mind blowing okay thank you we are so proud of you you. thanks so much for the call Ken that just gave me it put a little pep in my step to talk to Ava I gotta say yeah well, now you should know when you talk to 13-year-olds, don't ask them if uh, they hang out at the mall. I don't. I'm so trying you to keep my something. finger on the pulse of what's cool. Yeah, well. That's what it is. That's probably misguided as well. Those days are over for I us. I know. You and I being cool. We can't go to the mall. What are we doing? What are we doing here? We got a, you got a cardigan on. It's over, man. I, exactly. Pack it up. Exactly. I mean, nobody cool wears a cardigan, but I'm not cool. Well, a seven-year-old dressed by his mom or a 48-year-old man. <laughs> Those are the two options. <laughs> Ken knows I love a good cardigan. I, I, yeah. you Have you ever worn a cardigan, George? I love cardigans. Yeah, you actually look uh, quite dashing in Thank the cardigan. Thank you. Yeah. It means a lot. Yeah, there you go. Well, a happy new year to you, Ken. It's been a fun show. Yep, fun and times. I, I and that s- phone call, by the way, is inspiring. why we do what we do on yes. YouTube. Because she's watching the show on YouTube, and her parents, good on her parents, for setting some expectations that are really going to help her later on in life. This, that's really You fun. know what got me? Ava has a higher net worth than most of America oh at 13 years old. That Ouch. should inspire you to greatness, America, to make some changes this year, to increase your net worth by getting rid of the debt, which gets your net worth to zero, and then start investing for the future. Have a pile of money in the bank. That is financial peace in good times and bad, regardless of what happens in the world this next year. So we are rooting for you. We're here for you. And we're going to be back real soon. My thanks to my co-host, Ken Coleman, all the folks in the booth, Austin, Ben, James, Zach, Nathan, and you, America. Until next time, spend wisely, save intentionally, and give generously. Do you love a good Dave rant? Want to see the latest Ramsey Show videos going viral? Check out your favorite moments from the Ramsey Show on YouTube. Go watch and subscribe to the Ramsey Show channel on YouTube.